Hello there, my name is Neville. I'm one of the leaders here at Emmanuel Church and uh, it's my privilege today to continue uh, teaching from the Bible in a series called Buried, which we're looking at the life of Joseph. And uh, we let me just summarise the story so far um, before we hear chapter 40 of Genesis read out to us. We, we met Joseph uh, a little while ago as a 17-year-old. He was the favoured son of his father Jacob. Uh, and to demonstrate that, he made him a coat of many colours which caused his brothers to be very jealous of him. And the Bible even says they hated him. And then one day, far away from the family home, they decided to do away with him, uh, kill him, couldn't go through with it. So they sold him into slavery in Egypt. Slave traders picked him up and took him into Egypt. And then we find him in the house serving as a slave of a high government official called Potiphar. And in fact, he's in charge of all of Potiphar's household and does well and prospers. But then he's falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and is put in prison, uh, but God continues to favour him. And so that's where we find him today in chapter 40. And so we're going to hear that read out to us now. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offence against their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them. They continued for some time in custody. And one night, they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison. Each his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers, who were with him in custody in his master's house, Why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, we have had dreams, and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Please, tell them to me. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph, and said to him, In my dream there was a vine before me, and on the vine there were three branches, as soon as it budded, its blossoms shot forth and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, This is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. Only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favourable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head, and in the uppermost basket there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, This is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat the flesh from you. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker 
as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. So in chapter 40, you've just heard... Um, You've just, you've just heard that you've been introduced to two new characters or people in the story of Joseph, the cupbearer and the baker of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. The cupbearer in that culture uh, was probably the person who was in charge of Pharaoh's wine and drinks. He probably had a key to the wine cellar on a chain round his neck and he was the only one who was allowed access to it. And the baker was a bit simpler. The baker was the baker of Pharaoh and in charge of all the, the bread. And they've both ended up in prison. And you might be asking, why, why are they both in prison? Verse 4 says they have committed an offence against Pharaoh. And the text doesn't precisely tell us, but probably, and most commentators would agree, probably there'd been a plot to poison Pharaoh, they didn't quite know who was responsible and so they've put them both in prison while they investigate the matter. That's probably what's going on in here. Is it the wine or is it the bread? What was, what was the plot to, to uh, poison Pharaoh? And as we can see here from, uh, well actually we see it from the end of verse 22 of the previous chapter, Joseph has already put, been put in charge of all the prisoners. The favour of God continues to rest on him. So as we go through this chapter, I, I'm going to kind of go through it, not quite verse by verse, but not far off, and pick some points out of it that I think are relevant for us today as we seek to follow Jesus in the 21st century. So what is relevant from this story from thousands of years ago? And we believe the Bible is inspired by God, and therefore it is very relevant and powerful for our lives. So let's go through this. I've got some, some headings. Uh, but we'll go, through, we'll go through each verse and pull things out. So the first kind of heading I've got is, is a saviour who serves. You might say, well, what do you mean, Neville? Well, let's look at this. Verse 4, the captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them. That's the cupbearer and the baker, these two new prisoners. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them. See, Joseph is kind of a top prisoner. He's been put in charge of the prisoners under the prison authorities. And verse 4 says this, and he, that's Joseph, attended them, attended them. This is a Hebrew word that really means serving or ministering. And in God's kingdom and his plan for leadership, leadership really means service. It's called servant leadership. Most uh, brilliantly finds its fulfillment in Jesus himself who came, uh, who came not to be served but to serve and Joseph is the top prisoner here, but he serves these two new ones. He attends them. That's what it says. He attends them. And uh, we see in verse 5, it says, One night they both dreamed. The cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, each his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. See, they, they almost certainly would have talked to each other about these dreams they had. And verse 6 says, when Joseph came to them, he saw they were troubled. Verse 7, Joseph asked them, why are your faces so downcast today? And you might think, well, that's a silly question, Joseph, isn't it? Of course, they're, they're in prison. They're probably, they're probably afraid of their lives. They, they've been accused of poisoning Pharaoh. Of course, they're going to be downcast. Of course, they're going to be troubled. But I think Joseph must have noticed something else. There was something beyond the normal this morning, that, that in, in that day, that made him go to these prisoners and say, why are your faces so downcast today? He saw they were troubled. Something, something had happened to them that he could see that was beyond the fact they were just in prison. Joseph noticed something, and this shows up something of the character of Joseph. You see, if anyone had reason to feel sorry for himself and feel misunderstood... Surely it would be Joseph, attacked by his own brothers, sent, sold as a slave into Egypt, falsely accused and now put in prison. If anyone should be feeling sorry for himself, it should be Joseph. 
But we don't get any trace of that here. No trace of him feeling sorry for himself. No self-pity. No, he just seems to be aware of others. Why are you troubled today? That's what he's doing. He comes to attend to these two prisoners. You see, Joseph surely shows us something of Jesus here. See, Jesus comes down and takes on human form. Becomes fully man. He's fully God. He becomes fully man. Takes on the constraints, as it were, of time and space and walks this earth as a man. He himself kind of enters, if you like, the prison, the confines of our own existence because we're bound by time and space. We have one who comes in into our confines, into the place where we live, and his name is Jesus. You see, Jesus went through all our temptations, all our hardships, suffering even to death on a cross, and yet there is no evidence I can find of Jesus ever seeming to feel sorry for himself or asking other people to feel sorry for him. Okay, Jesus here is, the, is probably the perfect example of something we see in Joseph here. And so my question to you today is, are you downcast? As you come in today, as you, as you get up this morning, as you consider this evening, whatever time of the day you might be watching this, are you downcast? See, would people say, look at you and say you're downcast? Maybe you are. Maybe you're so overwhelmed with circumstances or things that trouble you, you actually look downcast. Now, many of you listening to this may, may feel, actually, I've got my church face on. <laughs> I'm very downcast inside, but I'm kind of smiling and so it's all okay. You see, you have a saviour who comes to you. The Bible says where two or three are gathered together, Jesus is there in the midst. And he wants to attend you today. He wants to serve you. He comes, the King of glory comes to serve you today if you will let him. Joseph serves these prisoners who look downcast. I want to say Jesus Christ comes to you today. He's risen from the dead. He's here. And he says, let me serve you today. Are you downcast? Are you struggling in your circumstances? I've come to rescue you. I came to identify with you came to be close to you. I've come to walk with you. Will you let him today? See, the love and care of Jesus is real for you today. See, maybe you'd say, I don't know. It's just so tough. You don't understand. I want to say Jesus is the one who gives hope like no one else can. He can be the lifter of your head. If you'll turn to him today, if you'll invite him in, even now maybe as you're listening to this, Jesus, I believe you're here. You feel far away. My circumstances feel like they've crowded on, on me. I, I feel troubled in my heart. My emotions are troubled. Jesus, come and bring peace to me. Come and draw close. Come and serve me in the way that only you can. It's wonderful that the saviour of the world comes to serve us, comes to help us, comes to give us hope, comes to give us life, comes to restore us, comes to renew us can do that for you right now. Reach out to him. Ask him. Maybe you don't even know if Jesus is real and you're listening to this. Say, Jesus, if you're real, come and show yourself to me. He's here to serve you. He's here to attend you. You think, as Christians, sometimes we can think, no, I can't do this. I, I, I can't be downcast. I can't let people know how troubled I am. Well, the Bible's actually full of people who are very troubled <laughs> and they pour their hearts out to God the question isn't whether you're troubled. It's not bad to be troubled. It's what you do with your troubled heart. Will you pour it out to God? You mustn't stay in it. I was just looking this week, the psalmist in Psalm 42 is struggling with things. He's, he's down, he says he's downcast. He says in verse 3, My tears have been my food day and night. While people say to me continually, Where is your God? Maybe you feel like that. God, where are you? My tears have been my food day and night. Ouch. Verse 5, why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you downcast? Why are you cast down? It's very similar language. And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my 
God. It says, verse 8, by day the Lord commands his steadfast night and at night his song is with me. My friends, it's okay to be downcast. I know times in my life when I felt very downcast, but by the grace and mercy of God, I've managed to, I've managed to find the steadfast love of God breaking in, the life of Jesus coming to me, restoring me, giving me hope. I want to say that's here for you right now. Reach out to him. He wants to attend to you in the way that Joseph looks out for these prisoners. Let's move on. So that's a saviour who serves. Let's keep going through this chapter. Second thing I want to mention here is dreams. Dreams, it would be a bit strange, wouldn't it, to talk about this chapter and not talk about dreams. Verse 8. So the, the, Joseph said, well, tell me, what's what have your dreams been? And they said to him, well, we've had dreams and there's no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, well, do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. You see, they weren't just curious about these dreams. They were definitely troubled, as we've just said. And Joseph has got form with dreams, hasn't he? He's had two remarkable dreams that got him in trouble, really got him in trouble with his parents and his brothers. Joseph knows all about dreams. You might think, well, Joseph is going to stay away from this. You might think, oh, no, I think I've had enough of dreams. Don't tell me. Jesus says, no, tell them. No, sorry. Joseph says, no, tell them to me. It's interesting that the Bible seems to show us that God may speak through dreams. We'll come and look at these two specific dreams in a moment. But the Bible, in the Bible, God does seem to speak through dreams. And I, I've had a look at this and I think there's, I think there's 21, 21 examples in Scripture of God speaking through dreams to 14 different people. Ten of them are in the book of Genesis. And so you've got Jacob gets spoken to in several dreams by God. Laban's spoken to in a dream. There's an unnamed Midianite in Gideon's time that's spoken to in a dream. God speaks to the pagan ruler, Abimelech, in a dream. Solomon gets spoken to in a dream. Nebuchadnezzar is spoken to in a dream. Daniel, spoken to in a dream. Pilate's wife is spoken to in a dream. And as I thought about this, more than, I think more than half of these people, I would say, are unbelievers in God. They're not following God. God is just breaking into their lives. And I thought about it. I think that's what's happened through the ages. And today, if we look around the world, in certain parts of the world, God is moving in dreams. I mean, maybe you've never heard of this. There's, there's many stories of people in certain parts of the world who go to sleep at night and they have a dream of Jesus appearing to them. And it's, if you go to this place at this time, you'll meet this person and they'll tell you about me. And we have, I could give you many stories, many, many stories of people doing that. And that's exactly what happens. And they, and, they, and they extraordinarily meet someone who tells them about Jesus. And it's exactly as they had the dream in the night. My friends, God has spoken through his word, the Bible. He's spoken through his son, Jesus Christ. But as a church, we believe in the daily inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And God speaks. Now, dream, if we have a dream from God, it's not the norm. It's not normal, but it happens then we, it, we need to submit it to the authority of the Bible. It needs to line up with Scripture, but we should be open to God doing that. I know people in this church who've had dreams about people that have then caused that person to become a Christian. We should be expecting God, by his Holy Spirit, to break into our lives daily and God to speak to us in unusual ways, and that may be dreams. Now, let me just say this. I haven't got time to open this up, but, but, but not every dream is from God. Okay, it's important to say that. In, Cle in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 3, it's very practical, the Bible. It says, for a dream comes with much busyness. So basically, uh, if you've got a busy mind, if you're under pressure, if you're very active doing a lot of stuff, you might dream more. And that doesn't mean it's coming from God. It just means you're very busy. Okay, so I, let's, 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 let's just get this in perspective. It isn't a norm. I don't think we should get every day and think God's going to speak to me in a dream tonight. It's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, but he does. Okay, but often it's the result of a busy mind if we have a dream. But let's be open to God speaking in unusual ways. If you feel that's you, if you feel you've had a significant dream or you're troubled by a dream, you think, is this from God? I would plead with you, go and check it out, either with your small group leader or a leader in this church and just talk it through. Get some counsel on it. Okay, dreams. So let's keep going through the chapter. 
Point three, the cupbearer's dream and interpretation. Verse 9 and 10, the cupbearer describes his dream of um, like vines that blossom, that, that then grapes come, and then wine comes out of that, and then that gets put into Pharaoh's cup, and then he puts the cup of wine in Pharaoh's hand, and in effect, that's what I used to do. <laughs> that's his job. He's had a dream in the night about what his job was, in effect, before he got put in prison. In verse 12, then Joseph says to him, well, this is its interpretation. <laughs> it doesn't hang around, Joseph. Uh, the three branches are three days. Verse 13, in three days Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand. Wow, that's clear. That's direct. Okay, I believe it's clear to me this interpretation is from God. You see, the three branches of three days is not obvious. <clears throat> it's not, it's not, oh yeah, that's clear, Joseph. No, it's not. How would Joseph know that three branches in this dream are three days? It could be three weeks, it could be three months. It could be three years. It could mean something completely different. You see, he's basically saying, you'll be back with Pharaoh in three days. You see, this can be proved wrong or right. This isn't, this isn't obscure. This isn't like, yeah, uh, I think, yeah, th there's going to be a mixture of colours here and I can see some shapes emerging and I can't quite work out what they are. No, no, this is, this is three days' time, you'll be back with Pharaoh. <clears throat> Joseph, you can be proved wrong with this. Three days' time, this is going to be right or wrong. Let's take some courage. It's not vague. Everyone's going to know if God's speaking through Joseph. Verse, interestingly then, in verse 14 and 15, he says this to the cupbearer. He asked to be remembered after the cupbearer is released. So he's so confident of what he's got saying. He's saying, when you're out then, and when you're back with Pharaoh, and when you're cleared of the charges against you, remember me. Remember me. That's how confident Joseph is. There's no, there's no doubt in his mind. This is, this is clear. I know what's going to happen. God's spoken to me. I want to say this to you as a bit of an aside this morning. You see, Joseph is in prison. I think it's clear under the hand of God. Joseph has submitted himself to God. Okay? He didn't fight back against wrong accusations brought against him that put him in prison. No, no, he's trusting himself to the hand of God on his life. But here's the thing. He still wants to get out of there. You see, God is with you in unpleasant circumstances. As you, as you listen to this, you might be going, you don't, you don't know how trapped I feel in my circumstances. I actually feel like I'm in prison. I know I'm not, but my circumstances feel like that. It's like I can't move to the right or the left. I can't seem to go forward. Can't seem to get out of this. It might be work-related. It might be family-related. It might be finance related it could be relationship I'm, I feel stuck things don't seem to change for me it's uncomfortable I want to say this to you it's okay if you feel like that to say God remember me remember me don't go passive on God and go well it's okay this is really horrible it's really tough but hey God will get me out of here it's okay I'll just let him do yeah it's pretty miserable, but yeah, I think God's in charge of this. No, I don't think that's what God wants you to do. It's not what Joseph, jo Joseph goes, remember me, remember me. I'm sure Joseph is thinking, no, no, I'm under the hand of God. It's okay, I'm trusting myself to God. But he says to the, says to the cupbearer, when you're freed, when you're vindicated, when you're back with Pharaoh, remember me in prison. I don't want to stay here. I don't want to stay here. I want to get out of this place. Are you wrestling with God? Don't give up with God. It's okay to say, God, remember me. God, draw close to me. God, lead me out of this situation. It may feel like you're in a prison cell. God, lead me out. I don't think this is what you, where you want me to stay. You might have led me into it, God, but lead me out, please. Maybe you've lost faith. You say, God, give me faith. I want to wrestle with you. Maybe God's put you in there so you can wrestle with him because he wants your engagement with him. Maybe you need to go to someone else and you say, I'm just finding it so hard. I've lost, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. Get someone to stand with you and pray with you. And together you say, God, remember this person. God, lead me out and see what God does. It's not unbiblical. It's not ungodly to pray that prayer. He wants you to, to struggle with him in prayer. 
to, to, to draw close to him, to have him draw close to you. Let's move on. Chief Baker's dream and interpretation. Verse 16. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favourable, yeah, I bet he's, he's probably thinking, this is going quite well. I like this guy, Joseph. He's just heard the cupbearer's dream. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's, that's OK. Oh, Joseph, yeah, I, I, you're a bearer of good news, Joseph. When, he, when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favourable, he said to Joseph, ha, I also had a dream. And there were three cake baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating out of the basket on my head. Verse 18, and Joseph answered and said, this is its interpretation. It's all okay so far. The three baskets are three days. Ah, yeah, I'm going to get the same interpretation. Verse 19, in three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head. And you'll see in the scripture, there's a dash. There's a pause. Now, even up to this moment, you see, if you go back, where is it? In verse, in verse 13, this is what Joseph says to the cupbearer. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you. So we've got to, in three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head. I think, that, I think the cupbearer is thinking this is going to be okay. I'm going to get a similar interpretation. Verse 19, in three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head, dash, from you, exclamation mark. Oh, dash and hang you on a tree. Ouch. Can you imagine the mood changing in the cell or wherever they were? He's going to take your head from you. He's not going to lift it up. The mood has changed. Let me say this. I, personally, and I'm being very personal here, I, I, I would rather preach the, the kind of the message of the cupbearer. <laughs> Everything's going to be okay. It's all good. It's all going to work out fine. Don't worry. It's kind of the message of the age. But you see, as someone who seeks to teach from the Bible, as we would in this church, I feel convicted that I must share the seriousness of the baker's message. You see, the Bible's very clear. In Romans, the book of Romans, it says, all of us are guilty, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all guilty before a holy God, and we should all understand the consequences of that. See, the Bible talks about unseen spiritual realities, unseen spiritual realities. Heaven and hell are real. See, the life we live doesn't last forever, and we have an eternity set before us that will make this life seem like a moment, a passing moment in comparison. And what we do with the message of Jesus Christ, whether we accept or reject it, makes all the difference in the life to come. See, he died as a substitute in your place, took on your sin and shame that separated you from God, and he offers you salvation only in his name. If you'll turn from your past, put your trust in the saving work of Jesus Christ at the cross, and you will be rescued in this life and in the age to come. It's the message I feel I must speak. I can't say it's all going to be okay. Where do you stand with this today? Let's keep going. Verse 20. The third day. Verse 20. I mean, what is the baker thinking? Three days pass. What is he thinking? Is he thinking, yeah, I don't believe you, Joseph. Maybe he's terrified. We don't know. On the third day, remember Joseph has said, this is the third, on three days. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday. He made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. See, this is the third day. I wonder if, I wonder actually if, if they're actually both feeling okay. Even the baker. Because Joseph's got it wrong. I'm invited to Pharaoh's birthday party. He's invited me to his party. But here's the thing. The hangman meets the chief baker 
at the door to the party and it goes exactly as Joseph had interpreted the dream. The word of God was true. See, I wonder who you'd like to be. I think we'd all like to be in this chapter, wouldn't we? We'd all like to be Joseph, if we're honest. We'd all like to be the one who brings God's truth, his word, his interpretation, the one who cares for the downcast in the prison. But you see, in a sense, we're all the cupbearer and the baker. An innocent man, Jesus, came into the confines of our existence prison if you want to use that word, the confines of our existence, and he shared our existence. That innocent man, Jesus, revealed God's message to us. He interpreted our condition, which I just explained to you, that we're separated from a holy God. And he comes and lives a perfect life, and he allows us to be right with God when we accept him. This innocent man, revealed God's message to us. He interpreted our condition. This innocent man, Jesus, was then proved to be true on the third day. See, Joseph is a foreshadowing of Jesus. See, you see in this story, death coming to the chief baker on the third day. But with Jesus on the third day, the tomb has to give up the dead and Jesus is raised from the dead by mighty power that the Father exerts on him and raises him from the dead. That's what happens with Jesus on the third day. This victory over death that we come under the, the, the umbrella of today, this fountain of life that opens up for the whole earth happens as Jesus is raised from the dead and he conquers death as it was prophesied he would do. See, this message of Jesus brings life if it's accepted and eternal separation from God if it's rejected. You see, Joseph is a marvellous picture of Jesus. He's a foreshadowing of Jesus, but he's also a contrast at the same time. See, Joseph's interpretation is only good news for the innocent man. The message of Jesus is good news for the guilty. The guilty get to go free. My friends, he will forgive, cleanse, restore, receive you if you will accept him. Come close to him again today. Are you downcast through circumstances? Reach out to him. Keep trying to help others. Reach out to him. Let him come and serve you today. The king of glory wants to break in on your life. Keep pursuing God for breakthroughs. It's okay, remember me God. Come to Jesus, maybe today for the first time. Let's come and worship him. Let's come and worship the king of life who on the third day was raised from the dead and who lives forevermore and is here today among his church. He's with you right now. And even in this, as I finish, even in this, they're trying to work out bread and wine. What is the root of death, of poison? What's the attempted poison through the bread or the wine? And with Jesus... We take communion, we take bread, which is his body given for us, and wine, which represents the blood of a new covenant poured out for forgiveness of sin for many. The bread and the wine bring life and hope. Let's worship him together.